This month we have had a lesson series and today we come to the close of that lesson series. The lesson series has been on the fact that he must increase but I must decrease. In other words, more of him and less of me. And during these past several weeks, we've attempted to honestly, and, and I, I want you to hear me because sometimes we just uh, have the tendency to come and sit and go through the routine and we, we really just go about our lives as if God said nothing to us. But we've attempted these past several weeks to uh, honestly examine where we are, where I am in my relationship to Christ because Christ is the standard. Is that all right? And his call and his invitation uh, to you and I is not just to a call and invitation to salvation, but it's honestly and truly a call to service to his cause. And we need to truly come to understand, recognize, and accept what it truly means to follow Jesus. And that's why as we close this lesson series, more of him and less of me, I would like for us to ask the question to ourselves. Am I fit for the king? Am I fit for the king? You see, we have to ask ourselves as children of the Most High God, what is top priority and who is top priority in my life? Not only what is, but who is top priority in my life? You see, Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, how often? Daily. And do what? Follow me. Is that all right? You see, as we spoke a little bit about last week, we understand that following him is not always what we originally perceived it to be. Because oftentimes it's natural for us to seek the path of least resistance. Are y'all hearing me this morning? You can say amen if you can. We seek the path of least resistance. But as we follow Christ, there's going to be some realities, uh, some harsh realities uh, that we must grow to learn to embrace if we're going to be fit for the kingdom. You see, in this same Luke 9, before Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, Jesus let it be known even about himself. Jesus said in verse 22 of Luke chapter 9, Jesus said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. You see, we always talk about that glorious resurrection, but we don't talk about what happened before that. Before that, he was rejected. Before that, he was slain. Is that all right? Look with me in Luke 9. 
We're going to be in Luke 9 throughout here, okay? Is that all right? Are y'all awake this morning? Amen. Shake your head. Do something. Wake up. We need to hear this. All right? God is in this holy temple, and he's speaking through his word. And as we learned in our classes yesterday, we ought not to think sometimes as we often are, are, are have a tendency to think, you know, we look at uh, the saints in the past and we say, well, man, they heard God. God actually spoke to them and they, they must be crazy because God actually spoke to them and they heard them and Jesus actually walked with them. But guess what? They probably look at us and say, y'all crazy because y'all have the whole counsel of God and this word is no less authoritative. This is the same word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. In other words, it's God breathed. Luke chapter 9. Starting with verse 43, we're talking about am I fit for the kingdom? I want to show you something. And they... Verse 43, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. You see, we have a tendency sometimes to just look at or at the perceived glory of following Jesus. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? People were caught up with what Jesus was doing instead of Jesus. Y'all will get it in a second. 43, he says again, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered every one of, while they wondered every one at all the things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, let these sands sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. You see, Jesus was saying, listen, we need to understand that the miracles that Jesus did were not for show. They all pointed towards who he was. And most important, the purpose for which he came. You see, people were caught up with what Jesus was doing instead of Jesus. But watch this. Jesus never allowed that to distract them from his purpose. And Jesus is, is telling them, let it sink in. I, I, I want to tell y'all, don't get caught up with the miracles because I still got some work to do. Is that all right? Let this sink in. All right? Let this sink in. What? For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Y'all are following me, but y'all ain't getting the reality of what this is all about. Verse 45, but... They understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask of him of that saying. You see, there's a lot of, when it comes to, to Christianity and following Christ, there's a lot of perceptions in the world. There's a lot of ideas of what it means to be a Christian. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Are y'all getting this? And, and, and we need to understand, we don't always understand the, the realities and, 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 and understand the, the harsh realities that come with and accompany following Jesus. And because we don't understand these realities, well, we allow ourselves to become distracted from the top priority in our lives of the spiritual work and the task at hand that God has given us. Even when we say we're determined to follow him. You see, even before we get to our text, starting in verse 57, we need to understand that Jesus made one reality clear to them. And we want to focus this morning on three realities that we must accept and embrace. Accept and embrace. There's one thing to accept something, there's another thing to embrace it. There's three realities in following Jesus that we have to accept 
and embrace. Is that all right? Look with me. He starts in verse number 51. The first reality that we must come to recognize, accept, understand, and embrace in following Christ is alienation and rejection from the world. Verse 51 says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In other words, Jesus was determined to go ahead and fulfill his purpose. Are y'all getting this? Verse 52, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, and they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So Jesus, the Jews always took this, this route through Samaria, but now that Jesus is determined to go and fulfill his, his purpose, amen, they won't let him come through. And Jesus is using this as a teachable moment to his disciples that, listen, if you're going to follow me, the first thing you're going to realize is that you're not going to be received by everybody. You're going to experience some rejection. You're going to experience some alienation because you follow me. Watch this, verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, without that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did. In other words, what y'all mean y'all ain't going to let us through? And sometimes when we stand for Christ and we're rejected and we're alienated, we want to we wanna do something to somebody. What you talking about? I'm a, I'm a servant of God. What? I wish Sister Morel would say, I say, oh, do you don't want me to come out of retirement. See, I retired from my old way of things, but, but I'll come out of retirement just for you. Are we getting this? But Jesus is teaching them, amen, about it. Verse 55, but he turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Is that all right? And they went to another village. In other words, when, when, you, are, when you and I, for the cause of Christ, because we're following Jesus, when we're rejected, when we're alienated, don't, don't get mad about it, just to go another way. You can't force people to like you. Is that all right? So the, the first harsh reality that we have to embrace is that of alienation and rejection from the world. And, and this, is, this is hard for us to deal with because it, it impacts on us. No one likes to be hated and rejected. But understand what Jesus said in John chapter 15 in the verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Watch what he says. If you belonged to the world, it will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Haven't you noticed since you've been following Jesus, people don't uh, like when you come around like they used to? Y'all ain't getting this. You see, and, and many times it's, it's a stumbling block to us because we don't want to be hated and rejected, right? We have a desire many times for acceptance and friendship with the world. In other words, now that I'm a Christian and I'm following Jesus, I'm still trying to play both sides of the fence. 
I'm trying to serve God, but I'm still trying to be a friend to the world. I'm, I'm telling my, my running buddies and, and my homies, hey, man, I'm still down, man. I'm still me. But watch what the Bible says. James 4.4 4 says, you unfaithful people. Don't you know that love for this evil world is hatred towards God? Whoever wants to be a friend of this world is an enemy of God. You say, what's the point, Mark? The point is this. As children of God, we don't have to compromise the honesty and the integrity of who we are as Christians in order to gain acceptance and friendship or avoid being rejected from those in the world. What's most important is that the way that we live our lives please God. And if the way I live, live my life doesn't please my family and my friends anymore, as long as it's pleasing God, then I'm okay with it. See, you got to be all right with being alienated. You got to be okay with being rejected for the cause of Christ. Are we getting this? You see, Christ then can use our lives, amen, when we live in accordance to his will, to silence our critics. And not only silence them, but ultimately use our lives to actually save them. Y'all ain't getting this. Look at this. The word of God in 1 Peter 2.12 1 Peter 2.12 says this. Be careful to live properly. King James says, honest. And we talked about this on Thursday night with the brothers in the men's training. Seven o'clock on Thursday nights. Amen about it. Yes. The, the ladies are meeting too. Thursday nights at seven o'clock. Amen. Being edified and encouraged. You say, that's too much. That's too much. And you can never have too much of seeking after God. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to put you on front street. I'm trying to encourage you. We're living in some evil and wicked times. What else are you doing? It says, be careful to live properly or honest. This word is honorable. In other words, it's an attractively good and appealing life that inspires and motivates others to embrace what is lovely, beautiful, and praiseworthy. In other words, even though the world opposes us, rejects us, and alienates us, we are to be living such lives for God that it still looks attractive to them. And sometimes you got to understand that they hate you because they ain't you. But God is not a respecter of persons. So when they come to themselves, you can say, listen, whatever you think I am or whatever you think I have, you can have it too. Because we know that we ain't much. We know that we, we just, uh, on our best day, a filthy rag. Am I right about it? But I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to serve the Most High God because I recognize each and every day how filthy I am. And he loved me anyway. So if he can love me and I'm filthy, then I want to follow that. Are we getting this? So he says, be careful to live properly, watch this, among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse or ridicule you of wrongdoing or as if you were doing wrong, they will see or watch your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God. 
You ever try to hate on somebody that's, that's not doing anything wrong? That's hard to do, isn't it? You try to make up stuff. Am I right about it? Hard to talk about somebody that's humble and honest and consistent in their life. Hey, man, you got to search. You get mad at yourself every day because you're looking for them to make some type of mistake. So you can talk about, see there, I tell God, did they supposed to be a Christian? You see, let me get serious for a moment. You and I must embrace the fact that when we're following Jesus, even those closest to you will alienate you and reject you and turn away from you. But look at what the Bible says in Psalm 27 and verse 20. Verse 10, Psalm 27, verse 10 says, even if, even if, even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will receive me or hold me close. So even when my family turn away from me, God has still got me. Are we getting this? Which takes us to the next and second reality that we must come to recognize, understand, and accept, and ultimately embrace in following Christ. Look at what it says now in Luke chapter 9, the verses 57 and 58. It came to pass that as they went in their way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow you whithersoever thou goest. I want to follow you wherever you go. And many times we get excited, don't we? And we, we get like Peter. We, we, we get to a point where we, we boast and say, well, I'll do, I'll, hey, it ain't not me, man. I'm, I'm going to follow God wherever. But watch what Jesus says. Verse 58, and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. What are you saying, Jesus? Jesus is actually expressing to this man, you sure you want to follow me? You sure? Because foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, I'm homeless. So you cool with that? You okay with that? Because the, the second harsh reality we have to understand and, and embrace is that it's not going to always be our own comfort, our own personal comfort. We, we won't always have that. We have to sacrifice our own personal comfort when we follow Jesus. We have to relinquish the comforts of this life when we're following Jesus. We have to sur surrender, we have to submit the comforts and the conveniences in this life. And that's going to be a challenge and a hindrance to us following Jesus. You see, in the church, I ain't going to even touch the religious world. I'm talking about the church. Because that's, that's what matters. Is that all right? Many times we wrongly associate following Christ with receiving or gaining secular rewards, comforts, successes, and benefits in this life. 
In other words, we think if I follow Jesus, then he going to work it out over here. This ain't the price is right. This is impress your luck. This is in jeopardy. In other words, this is not a bargain game. This is, this is not a game. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, you got to be willing to give up everything. It's not going to be easy. Is that all right? Are we getting this? And our, our, we need to teach our young people Sometimes we, we sometimes want to bargain with our young people, come to church and you'll get this. So come to church and you'll get that. Follow God and you'll get this. Don't set them up for failure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Don't set them up for failure. Teach them the truth. Sometimes we want to re reward people for doing nothing. Are y'all getting this? That's the mentality we have. Oh, well, well we're going to bless them. We're going we to reward them. And they ain't doing nothing. And then they get in the mentality where I don't do anything, but I'm still expecting. And then I, I grow up to be an older member to just come to be served and not to serve. And that's why the church isn't doing what it's supposed to do in these communities because we come to be served and not like Jesus came to serve. Y'all ain't getting this. Watch this. Following Christ will never be a matter of comfort and convenience. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24 and 33 is what I want to really focus on real quick. And we're going to hasten, all right? Matthew 6, 24 and 33, Jesus said, No man can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth or God and money. Then in verse 33, he says, but, but first be concerned, first be concerned, King James says, but seek ye first. But I like this uh, translation, is that all right? But first be concerned about his kingdom and what has his approval, then all these things will be provided for you. You see, we have that backwards. We want God to provide not just our, our needs, but our wants, and then we'll follow somewhat when we got time, when it's a matter of convenience. Am I right about it? Look with me real quick. First Timothy chapter 6, we need to get this. Because we need to understand 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting with verse 6. Many of us are trying to get ahead in this life. And in trying to get ahead of this life, we actually fall behind with the Lord. And I'm not sitting up here preaching that pursuing your aspirations is a, is a sin. That's not a sin. But you have to understand what takes preeminence. Christ in his kingdom takes preeminence. And Jesus has already told us that without me, you can do nothing. Is that all right? So if we can just learn to uh, put the same effort that we put forth in some of our worldly pursuits, if we can take that same effort and put it towards our soul, then we'll be going somewhere. 1 Timothy 6, starting with verse 6, says, Yet true godliness with contentment itself is great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. Go ahead and try to reserve a U-Haul on your funeral day if you want to. You won't be using it. Verse 8, 
So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. But people who long to be rich, now understand, this is where we get it mixed up. Sometimes we try to put it on rich people or people who, who have wealth. No, it's not about, you can be poor and be jacked up. Notice the text says, but people who long to be rich, stop playing the number. Oh, I hit. You just hit and won what you just spent for the last 20 years. But people who long to be rich fall, watch this, fall into temptation and are trapped by many foolish and harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And don't we see a lot of evil? And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Well, God understands. I, I, I got to make a living. But don't forget to make a life. Your living doesn't matter without life in Christ. Are we getting this? You see, Paul reminds us when we talk about our own personal comforts, Paul reminds us in Philippians 4, starting with verse 11, he says, not that I was ever in need for I've learned to be content with whatever I have I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything I have learned the secret of living watch this in every situation whether it's with a full stomach amen about it or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You see, this content means, it, 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 the, the definition is a sense of satisfaction because of living in God's content, in God's fullness. And therefore, it is entirely God produced. It's an inward thing, not an external thing. It's independent of external circumstances. So even if my external circumstances are all messed up, when I'm living in accordance to God's will, I can still be sufficient and adequate. I don't have to look for sufficiency in possessions or things or watch this y'all in people. Sometimes we think we need people to be adequate. They fulfill me. They complete me. So does that mean when they leave you you're incomplete? You see, we look for in people what only God can truly give. You see, when you're content, true contentment is valid in high times and in low times. No matter what's going on in my life, when I'm truly content in the Lord, I'm all right. I'm satisfied. It's going to be all right. And guess what? I can not only say that, I can say that and mean that. How are we getting this? We need to hasten on. This brings us to our last reality that we have to recognize, understand, accept, and ultimately embrace in following 
Christ, and this is not an easy one. I want to give you a warning ahead of time. Amen about it. Look with me in verse 59. Luke chapter 9. And he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me or allow me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at my home, at my house. I'm going to stop right there because well, we need to understand something. Verse 59, he says, Lord, suffer me first. And that word first is, 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 is key and we need to understand what, what he's really doing, what this man is really saying is, uh, yes, I want to, I'll follow you, Lord, but uh, I have something else that's top priority first. And, and this, when you really get into the exegesis of this text, uh, it actually implies now, it implies that this man would be glad to follow Jesus, but not during the lifetime of his father. It actually is speaking to the fact that his father is not even dead yet, when you really get into it. Because if his father was already dead and buried, he would have already been preoccupied with that. Not even to hear Jesus call an invitation. So he's saying, wait a minute, I, I want to follow you, but let me go home and make sure when my father dies, I'm there to take care of everything. And not only that, but I, I need to reconcile my inheritance, my part of things that belong to me. Y'all ain't getting this. Y'all ain't getting this. Are we getting this? Listen, Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying, listen, there is no higher priority than our duty to Christ and his kingdom. And I know some of us are like, what? But that's a family member. And, and, and I got to take care of family. The, the Lord want me to take care of family. But Jesus is saying, listen, there's no higher importance than my kingdom. He says, let the dead bury their dead. So we have to understand that Jesus is really letting us know that what's going to be a hindrance to us in following him is being preoccupied with spiritually dead people. Y'all ain't getting that. You'll get that when you get home. You see, spiritually dead people are only concerned with spiritually dead things. And we are alive spiritually. So we are to be preoccupied with spiritual things. And we can't get caught up with spiritually dead people and their spiritually dead things because it takes us off of the task at hand. You got other family members who can handle that stuff. We need not be so concerned with, well, who's who getting big mama? Big mama left that to me. Don't worry about it. God going to take care of you. Let them fight over that. And Lord have mercy, have we seen some wicked attitudes when people die? You see the best and the worst in people when people in your family die. Are we getting this? Watch this. Understand the most important benefits we need to be concerned with is that of a spiritual nature. 
You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 4, I, I, I was going to skip over this, but I, I have to go here. Because I, I, I want us to understand this. Because sometimes uh, we deceive ourselves into thinking that, well, you know, I'm, I'm, but I'm out here doing a good deed, and it's for the Lord. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You, you, okay, I understand that. You, you doing things in the world and you making the world a better place, God be praised. But his spiritual business comes first. Spiritual business. Second Timothy chapter two and verse four says, no man that warreth. Now understand, you and I are in a war, a spiritual war. Are we getting this? And guess what? The enemy is not fighting fair. So you need to have all your armor on. Notice the Bible says put on the whole armor. Because the enemy, he ain't just trying to jab. He's trying to knock you out. He's trying to kill you. So he says, no man that warreth, watch this, entangleth himself with the affairs, with the affairs of this life, why? That he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Now watch this. Why did I enlist in the army of God if I still want to be entangled with the affairs of the world? Brothers and sisters, we need you. We're over here taking fire from the enemy. And, and, and our backup, Brother Willie, our backup is, is entangled in the worldly affairs. We've called in reinforcements, but the reinforcements are preoccupied with the affairs of this life. And we over here under fire getting, getting it handed to us, and we don't got no help. I reach out to you, I call you for help, can't get in contact with you. Don't return a call. See you maybe once a week. We're supposed to be on the battlefield every day. But yet we can go to war out there for somebody in this world. And we're there on time. Never miss a day. Never call off sick. But when it comes to the work of God, oh, I won't be back. <clears throat> won't be back this evening. We need you. You the one enlisted. Now, if you don't want this anymore, then let us give you a dishonorable discharge. Not an honorable discharge, a dishonorable discharge because you're the one who took on this work. And watch this, God deserves our best. You say you're getting kind of loud because this moves me. We serve the most high God and God deserves our best, not what's left. If, if, watch this, if you can't cut it, then at least be, be honest enough to say, hey, I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. Don't just leave us hanging. Jesus needs us to be reliable, dependable. But yet when we go to the secular world, our resume is filled with, I'm reliable, I'm dependable, trustworthy. Come to God, we don't even have a resume. Am I right about it? And the other one said, I will follow you. In verse 61, I will follow you, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at my home in my house. And notice that Jesus doesn't let them. Because Jesus knows if I let you go back home, they may convince you not to come back. I know they got a hold on you. They'll talk you out of your enlistment. 
Is that all right? And, and we need to understand as servants of the Most High God, we're not only to be almost removed, but become altogether removed from the influences in this life. You say, but I, I love Grandmama. No one's telling you not to love Grandmama. Go with me to Matthew 10, starting with verse 34. No one's not telling you to not take care of your family. But God is telling you, he's, he's letting us know the reality of the situation is this. If it comes down to grandmama or mama or daddy or children or spouse, when it comes down to them versus me, you have to be willing to come with me at the drop of a dime. Not even think twice about it. Are we getting this? And sometimes we're, we're betwixt. We're being pulled over here and being pulled over here. And Jesus is saying to us, it shouldn't be no pull. You should be totally committed to me. And what it actually shows is that we have little faith. Because if we truly know that if we give everything to God in the first place, he'll take care of that. But we have the big idea that I got to take care of everybody. I got to do everything. I got to have it in. You ain't in control anyway. You've never been in control. You'll never be in control. Is that all right? You ever notice even when you and I give our attention to certain things, it still go wrong? And wind up worse? And then you have to go to God anyway? When things are all messed up even more so? And God is saying, well, you created the mess. If you would have just came to me first, I would have took care of it. We buy these heavy weights on ourselves and we, we, we obligate ourselves to all these things in this life to our family and everybody else. But what about to God? I know God understands. <laughs> Keep telling yourself that lie. You say, well, you just don't know my situation. I don't. I'm not, I'm not omniscient. God does. He's omniscient. Matthew 10. And we'll be out of here. This was our meditation. Matthew 10, starting with verse 34. And I'm going to have to cut this short. But Jesus made it plain. He said, think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at variance against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Somebody ought to say amen about that. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Now understand that he's using a figure of speech and he's using comparison, comparison figure of speech in, in relation to compared to your love for me, your love to them should look like hate. And that's what he expresses in Luke chapter 14, in the verses 26 and 27. He's saying that our love for our family compared to our love for him should look as if we hate them. It's not his will that we hate them, but it's his will that we love them less than what we love him. Is that all right? Don't you realize that those who you love, God loved them before you loved them? He's the one who gave them to you. They belong to him. And how dare us love something that God gave us more than who gave it to us? That's going back to Romans. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator.
He says, verse 38, and he that taketh not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. It goes back to surrendering everything for the Lord. And I know this is tough to receive. It's tough to hear this. But it's the truth anyhow. Are we getting this? Nothing, nothing, and no one comes before Jesus. And that's why he says, to close, he says in verse 62, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back. Now you see he's talking to people who understand something about agriculture. And in agriculture when you're plowing, it's essential, it's necessary, and it's crucial to look intently and pay attention to what's ahead. Otherwise, your task cannot be accomplished. Go ahead and try to mow your grass when it gets warm, if it gets warm. Long way away, isn't it? But the next time you mow your grass, mow your grass looking back. And y'all know, if you're anything like me, you want the lines to line up so the neighbors can move. Man, that's a nice lawn. See a leaf on there, you got to get out there, get that leaf off of there. We want our, line, our lawns to be uh, immaculate. Is that all right? Yeah, manicured. Manicure lawns. We spend a lot of money for people to manicure our lawns. Only for it to grow back in a week. Still going to grow back. Is that all right? But try to do it looking back. And Jesus has given us an a, a, a illustration and a picture of what we look like when we enlist to follow him but yet we're looking back. What's, what's going on with Big Mama? Uh, what's going on? Oh, oh, oh Lord, have mercy. Uh, I got to tend to this. Lord, I'll be right back. Well, guess what? Your work, your task at hand is not being accomplished. And Jesus is saying, listen, when you look back, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back, watch this, is fit for the kingdom. When Jesus gave his life for you, for you, for me, he didn't look back. And I'm so thankful to God that he didn't. He didn't look back. He didn't get distracted. He was on that cross in agony and in pain, being mocked. If you be the Christ, come down from the cross and we'll believe you. I'm so glad that he stayed. I'm so glad that he stayed on the cross because it meant salvation. It meant justification. It meant sanctification for me. Because truly and honestly, I'm the one who should have been up there. You're the one who should have been up there. And when we put our hand to the plow and we look back, what we're truly doing is putting them up there again. Now you think of that. Crucifying him all over again. Because we're concerned 
about something that's temporary. Are you fit for the kingdom? We pull this projection screen down and take turns for the rest of the day looking at our lives for everyone to see. Does my, would my life show that I'm fit for the kingdom? You say, I don't, want to, I don't want to put my life on front street for everybody. Well, it's already being recorded. Yeah. The mind of God. Everything the Bible says in Hebrews 4, before him is naked. Nothing is hidden. To whom we have to do. In other words, for our lives, there's coming a day when we're going to have to reckon with the Lord. And I know what you're saying, man. This, this is a beat up sermon. I'm just trying to scare tactic us. But I want you to know something. I'm going to finish on an encouraging note positive note. Go with me <clears throat> to the same Luke 8, 18, 18, Luke 18. Because many of us I know right now are sitting and saying, man, that's a lot to ask. And I'm not there yet. So just uh, preacher man, slow down. Slow your roll. You know, we, it, it's a growth. I know that. But I want to give you some encouragement. Is that all right? Luke 18 and verse 28, Peter felt the same way. Peter said in verse 28 of Luke 18, then Peter said, Lord, we have left all and followed you. In other words, man, we left everything to follow you. What are you talking about? It's going to be hard. We left everything. We left our families. We left our, our work. We left everything to follow you. And he said unto them, Truly I say unto you, there is no man, anthropos, man or woman, that hath left house or parents or brethren or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. In other words, if you think it's too much, Jesus is saying what truly matters is that you're going to get more following me, not only then, but you're going to get it now. You're going to get it now in this present time. You get it now. You see, what he's saying is, listen, even with all the hell and high winds you got to face in your life, at least when you're following me, I'm with you. My grace is sufficient. See, I got a lot of hell in my life right now. As long as Jesus is with you, you're going to be all right. Now you need to be worried if he's not with you. If you're here this morning and Jesus is not your advocate, if he's not your Lord and Savior, then you have something to worry about. You can come having heard the word. Do you believe it? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Are you willing to repent of your sin? That means turn. In other words, you turn. I recognize, Lord, that I can't turn by myself, but I need your help to turn me where I need to go. That's what repentance is. 
confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. For confession is made unto salvation. I'm confessing that he is. I believe and know and trust that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then in obedience, in obedience, in obedience, because guess what? Faith alone is dead without obedience. Abraham's faith wasn't accounted to him or imputed to him as righteousness until he offered Isaac. Until he did it. And our salvation in Christ Jesus is not active until we complete in obedience the act and requirement of baptism. That's what the Bible teaches. Meaning, brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, by the authority of Jesus, for the remission of your sins. You see, when I confess them, many people say, well, I confess them and make them Lord of your life. You still got your sins on you. It's not until you get into that watery grave of baptism that your sins are remitted. Because in the baptism, we reenact the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'll repeat it, and I'll repeat it, and I'll repeat it again. No one, unless they're authorized by Christ, has no business telling you to get in that water. They have to be an authorized agent of Jesus Christ in order to have the authority to tell you to get in that water. In other words, let me just make it plain. In other words, whatever you follow, whatever teaching you follow can't be after men. It has to be the doctrine of Christ. If it's something man made up, then it's something that God doesn't recognize. And if he, didn't, if he don't recognize it, he hasn't authorized it. Oh, you can go anywhere. That's what they tell you. Ain't that what Joel Osteen says? Say this, and then go to the choice, the church of your choice, and I believe I believe you've been you believe I've been saved. I want to know. Jesus said, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Romans 6 17 says, But God be thanked that you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. That you've obeyed that form of doctrine, that's what sets you free. That form, that two post, that mold, in other words, is not going to change. We follow the same doctrine that the apostles followed. We have no permission to follow anything else. Jesus said himself in Matthew 15, every plant that my heavenly father hath not planted shall be rooted up. In the religious world, you have a lot of plants in the garden. But only one belongs to Christ. Now, if you have any questions about that, we stand ready and willing to study with you. It's not being braggadocious. It's not being offensive, prayerfully. But we want you to know the truth. Just like when you go to the bank. Amen. You don't trust them. Tell us you still count out your money. Don't you? They can say, oh, you want an envelope? No, I want to count it, and then I'll put it in an envelope. <laughs> but it came out of the machine. The machine is smart. I don't care how smart that machine is. I'm still going to count my money. <laughs> I got to stop, y'all. For those of us who have been baptized and added to the body, are you fit for the kingdom? Don't think because you're in the gates of the kingdom, the church. Yes, the church is the kingdom. They're one and the same. Amen. Who hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.18. Yes, the Bible is right. Are you fit for the kingdom? Or have you put your hand to the plow and looked back? God has been too good for us to look back.